Hey, welcome to the Rougeau podcast, father and son. And this is my son, Jean-Jacques. And this is my dad, Jacques. You guys are ready? We're going into the tiki. Let's go. Let's do it. You know, I'm Québécois, but I like the tropics. C'est pour ça que j'ai acheté mes tickets chez Sol Tropical à Saint-Roch-de-la-Chigan. Un produit 100% québécois, 20 ans sans perdre sa couleur et une espérance de vie de plus de 50 ans. Vous pouvez faire comme une cuisine extérieure, votre chambre d'invité ou même votre propre podcast. Ici Jacques Rougeau, faites comme moi et amenez le soleil chez vous avec Sol Tropical. La vie est tellement plus belle. Chaque année, on met nos raquettes pour sillonner la forêt des montagnes Chic-Choc afin d'entailler chacune de nos 100 000 érables pour en récolter l'eau au printemps. Notre réseau de tubulures transporte des milliers de litres de ce précieux liquide sucré vers la cabane où il sera filtré et traité à l'osmose inversée. L'eau d'érable concentrée soigneusement évaporée pour obtenir cet or blond au goût unique d'une qualité incomparable. Une véritable tradition. Le sirop et les produits d'érable de ma cabane en Gaspésie, c'est bon rare. Out. Félicitations pour ton initiative de créer cette série d'interviews fantastiques. Merci aussi de souligner l'importance de dire non à l'intimidation. Une grande priorité pour avant tout les enfants. Children Now organise many activities during the year for underprivileged children. Summer camps, winter camps, Christmas parties, Easter parties. The main focus of all these activities is to show children that at the end of the tunnel, there is light. Mais avant tout, les enfants ont aussi une ligne d'écoute pour tout ce qui a trait au bien-être des enfants. Et en ce moment, nous organisons une campagne qui touche tout ce qui a trait à l'intimidation, la cyberintimidation et la discrimination raciale. L'intimidation, c'est l'affaire de tous. Bullying is everyone's business. Hey, hey, hey! Bonjour tout le monde! Ça va bien, Jay? Oui, ça va. Toi, ça va? Ah oh, oui, je suis assez excité. Là. GF, ça va bien? Super, putain. Yeah, yeah. Listen, euh, on a tout un invité cette semaine. Euh, on va parler anglais beaucoup sur ce podcast-là. Fait que sortez vos dictionnaires. Et puis, euh, j'aimerais juste dire que c'est un honneur, un privilège pour nous de recevoir l'homme qui est devant nous, parce que c'est pas juste un gars qui, a, qui est venu bien, bien populaire. Son père, c'est un grand, grand ami de famille à moi. Et puis, euh, fait que, Michael, euh, on, we forget Mafia Boy, no, it's no more Mafia Boy, or do you mind? It's there. Mafia it's there. Boy is still there. You look like Mafia Boy. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, you remind me of a movie without Pacino. Yeah. It's the Italian, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, you have a beautiful wife, Shannon, right? Yes, correct. And you've been married or are you married? or? We're common law married. I didn't have the whole ceremony and all that uh i love her and that's what's important to you me. don't want to give her half of the house no <laughs> okay that's good relax that's good. relax <laughs> and i heard you got a beautiful son yes two years old he just turned two his name is lincoln and um for it, his name's actually to me link because of the video game that i grew up playing which is the legend of zelda And the hero is called Link. The main Ooh. character, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. why I named him Link. Wow. And yeah, I, I used to play that game too on 64 when I was young. Exactly. Ocarina yeah. of Ocarina Time. Ocarina one of the time. best games of all yeah, time. Yeah, I'm not yeah. a computer guy. You'll see. My son is the brain. <laughs> him too. Okay, okay, so I'm going to do the interview with him. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm the you, dangerous you, one though. I go yeah, and do okay. it. All right, all right. Okay, you're, okay, you're, okay. you're back. You're back. <laughs> so, Michael, you, you started um, on computers when you were very young, right? Yeah, Jay, I want to just say one thing first. I want to talk about, you have a brother, Lorenzo. Yes, I have an older brother, Lorenzo, three years older. Uh, very different character, very people-oriented. I and don't know your brother, Lorenzo. I knew you a little bit from your dad, and Lorenzo, I didn't know him, so he's older. He's, he's named older. after your grandfather, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, the golden child, if you will. And oh, I'm, yeah. I'm just the black sheep of the uh, family. Uh, hey, hey, welcome to the family. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got Raymond, and then there's me. <laughs> he, he, he's a very independent guy he, yeah. uh, he does his own thing very successful and I'm close with him he lives three minutes from me really yeah down that's the street cool. so awesome. I see him almost every day that's awesome that's cool that's awesome yeah. 
Okay, uh, so, when you were a kid. Okay, so uh, Michael, when you when you were six years old, you you started using computers. That's when you started, right? You your dad had a computer or something like this. How did, how did you get in contact with computers to start off with? So it's an interesting story because um, my father, as you know, worked in the transport industry, and unfortunately, my parents got divorced when I was five, and that was a little bit tough on my family. And uh, unfortunately, my dad, you know. It was hard for him to deal with because he relied a lot on a family because, you know, he worked a lot and he wanted to provide. Anyway, you fast forward a, a year after the divorce and he has weekend custody of me and um, he needed to find a way to occupy my time because he was on the phone a lot trying to provide for us because, you know, the transport industry, a bus breaks down, a driver doesn't show up. You got to be on, you got to be on call 24 yeah, seven. Yeah. Full time. So, yeah. So... I was a very energetic kid. I was very intrigued by puzzles, and I, I always liked to explore. You so were he, very, you were a very smart kid. Well, thank that's you. what your dad told me, and that's what your lawyer told me too. I spoke with your Yan. Yeah. And everybody tells me how smart you are. I think it was just a hunger for knowledge. That's what made me smarter. It's that I wanted to know why and how things worked. And I think that fueled it. Of course, you need some, obviously, level of intelligence to understand. But I think the hunger for knowledge is what fueled me. So my dad saw that. And, you know, to preoccupy my time, he ended up taking a computer from his office. And he brought it to home to me. And he said, here, figure it out. But Daddy, what he didn't know is in the middle of the night, you were going on your computer when he was sleeping. Nonstop. Nonstop. <laughs> uh, as soon as I got my first computer, I was just infatuated with it, what I can do, how I can manipulate this device. And that's what I quickly realized. Like when I booted into the computer for the first time, it sat there waiting for me to input a command. So I am the master of this device and I can make it do whatever I want it to do. And that was the most intriguing concept to me. So... It, it gave you some power when you were young. Is that how you felt about that? Yeah, the power to explore with my mind. It was like a tool. Like the term I would use is augmentation. Like it's an augmenting ability that I can use this device and accomplish the goals that I wanted to accomplish. So I spent every day, all day, all night on the computer. So at that time, it, it had, at what age it became an obsession? The second I got it. This, from the second I, I got it and I plugged it in and I powered it on, I was obsessed. And also, you have to keep in mind, this was in the year 1990. And not it wasn't very common for a, a six-year-old to have a computer at home at that point. Now, obviously, this is common. It's in every household and kids are given tablets at three years old. But at six years old in 1990, I was probably one of the few kids in, in all of Montreal that had a computer to himself. When did you start feeling you had a don't? So you had a, come on, son, like a, a, skill. a gift, you were gifted. When did you realize that you were gifted? That happened a little later down the line because I had no one to compare to. And then at nine years old, the internet came out for me. That's because AOL was offering a promotion, America Online. And they were sending these CDs out, uh, these promotional tools, if you will. That was a CD that you would get in the mail. And uh, it would offer you 30 days of free internet access. Okay. And I thought, what's this? I read the package. You could go through a portal. You could talk to other people that love technology. So I was fascinated. Okay. So I went on right away and I started to look around and I'm like, this is interesting. But there was a problem. I was looking to talk to people about my love for computers and technology and see what they were doing with their computer. And I quickly realized, like, on this America Online chat, everything was uh, M4W. What do you mean? And that's exactly what I said to myself. And then I went <laughs> in the channel, and I realized M4W means man for woman. Oh, it's a dating. It's all thing. dating. Yeah, yeah. They were all dating on there. <laughs> guys looking for girls, girls looking for guys, and guys looking for guys. This is where ASL <laughs> started, which is the famous age sex location. And... I'm nine years old at this point, and I'm like, what the fuck are these people doing here? It doesn't make sense. And then I started looking around, and I started making some comments to people because I was disappointed. This wasn't what I was looking yeah, for, yeah. you know? So I made some comments to some people. Someone didn't like a comment that I had made, and he said, you know what, buddy? You need to go. 
And me, I'm, you know, behind the computer. What do you mean? What I need to go? What, what are you going to do about it? You know, <laughs> I kid you not. 10 seconds later, your connection to AOL has been disconnected. The guy disconnected you. Yeah. He ejected you. He popped me right out of AOL. I was able to re-log in and I was fascinated. A light bulb went off in my head. How does somebody have the power and the capability of remotely cutting off my AOL internet connection? Wow, so that's where it started. That's all where it started. And then I started looking around and I found the program. The program that he used was called AO Hell. Yeah. And uh, I got access to this program and it, it was called a punt attack that he launched against me. And sure enough, you can imagine what happened next. I started punting off everyone on America Online. Wow. So, how, so how much of an impact do you think that this whole dating uh, aspect of humans made technology evolve? A lot. It's huge, eh? It's, if you look at the social component and people wanting to display stuff or like find a, a partner it's such a huge component i think that's what accelerated the internet more than anything yeah that's crazy i'm gonna ask you a question yeah when you started uh, going into people's uh, uh internet like the, what the guy did to you that just kicked you out yeah was that legal or illegal at the time to kick someone out so the internet was sort of the wild wild west at this point right like there was no set parameters and rules but Probably by definition, it was illegal, but there's Everybody no way. Everybody was doing it. Everybody was doing it. It was the wild, wild west. We're, talk we're talking, you know, in the 90s, like there was very limited control as to what was going on on the internet and what you can and can't do, right? But the interesting dynamic is, is that it was a 30 day trial, right? And I don't know when it was going to come to an end. That's the thing. And I, a couple months prior to me getting that disc for AOL, my dad had given me his credit card to order some Lego because I was also obsessed <laughs> with Lego. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, uh, what showed up was boxes and boxes of Lego. I ordered $600 of Lego. <laughs> so I wasn't sure if my dad was going to give me access to the credit card again to reinstate the America Online because at the end of the trial, you have to put a credit card to keep using it. So in that same AOL program, uh, there was the ability to appear as an administrator to other users. Okay. So I thought, how can I take advantage of this fact? So I, I went on appearing as an administrator and I asked other users and I told them this exact message, due to a power outage, I need to verify your login name and password. And I, first four or four attempts were successful. I got other people's accounts information, so I didn't need my dad's credit card and I could stay online. So people were un completely unaware of cybersecurity at this time. They still aren't today, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you something. There's a guy called Sergio that may have changed your life. He, he, he made you pass a test or something just to see your IQ or I don't know how, what was the story with Sergio? So at a certain point, my dad started to realize I'm far advanced in computers, technology, and he had a friend named Sergio, and he thought it might be wise to connect the dots and see if, you know, how advanced I am. And so Sergio set me up with a test and asked me to write a program, and uh, he was blown away. He's like, even I was nowhere close to the technical level of his of Michael at his, uh, at when and I was his age. How old were you there? How old were you when you saw Sergio? Good question. Probably... 11? 11, 12. That's what I thought I'd read. Yeah, read somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah 11. That's amazing. Um, and at what moment did you... I guess I, I asked you the question before, but did you start getting worried? Like, like, you knew you were doing something that everybody was doing. It's the far west. Everybody's gunning. But then after a while, you're so good... Now you're outclassing and you, you go, you're getting heavy. And, 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 and when did you start being, you know, like, maybe I should slow down a bit? Or was there any of that? Or it was just go, go, go? No, it kept getting more and more and more. Um, I had discovered an entire hacker community that was comprised of tens of thousands of hackers. And uh, I thought it was a unique opportunity for myself to continue exploring technology because I think the problem is like with the media and how hacking is viewed is not accurate. 
all that we see in the news is like negative uh, yeah. connotations with hacking when really hacking is a healthy thing in like how like how you're taking something and using it for other than its intended purpose that's the definition of hacking and that to me is what creates innovation now of course like everything else you could go buy a knife online and you could chop vegetables with it or you could or, go kill yeah, someone absolutely yeah. the decision is up to you and that's the problem like the media only promotes or shows like the negative side of hacking sells more listen people <laughs> feed off of fear right so that that's negative bias exactly and that's the world that we live in but there is a very healthy component that is accelerating and propelling the world forward which is the healthy hacking which is so as you were growing up through the through your learning you you, you went through different groups of hackers if, if i'm not mistaken right different levels right? yep and you made it all the way to a very high level with the, group, the highest the group tnt correct tnt force can you explain to me a little bit what the dynamic was when you were a part of this elite group of hackers everybody had their own mission right everybody had a different purpose within the group yeah, it was like a company structure. There was roles. So I started with a group called War as IWC, which was like just a smaller group and kind of my entry level and where I really got into hacking. And then uh, I sort of became like a, a nomad at that point and a mercenary just taking out people myself. And I was like a gun for hire. Certain hackers would say, hey, we what's a nomad? Just someone who doesn't respond to like certain group archetypes, like just run roaming by themselves okay. type of thing okay. i was a lone wolf i guess you could say at a okay. certain point and um i started targeting really high level hackers and i was successful in my attempts and then eventually a group came around which was known as tnt force and they were the most elite <laughs> russian hacker group in the entire world at that point point. and they had heard of you or you heard of them well they knew of me because in the community i was taking out like publicly speaking, like taking over certain channels that other hackers ran, and you can see that I'm the one doing it, right? Like, uh, so, so you, in other words, this is not all hidden. People know that it's you. Well, hidden within the community, right? It's it's not hidden within the community, but to obviously average people, unless you're on this internet relay chat, which is known as IRC, which is the community I was a part of, it was like a chat application that allowed you to connect to the network. Okay. And uh, to them, it was public, but to obviously everyone else, you know, unless you're a part of IRC and you see what's going on, you don't know. Like my parents had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. But I made a name for myself and they came around and they um, they wanted to pick me up. And of course, you know, it was the an T honor. The TNT group. You yeah, the TNT force group. Okay. And uh, I knew of them, obviously, because they were the best and they wrote the majority of the exploits that hackers were using like that's how big they were so they, they were creating the tools correct yeah yeah and um so it was an honor to join a group like that and oh yeah you were excited yeah you oh my must. god it was well they're like the top level group so it's like you getting WWF. scouted to to the big leagues that's and uh, WWF. exactly <gasps> you know you're you're okay. fighting with the tops at that point. So they were they were not only known in Quebec, the TNT. They were known like in uh, worldwide. In, uh, worldwide, yeah. Worldwide, the members were worldwide. Um, there was a, a lot of Russian members. You were saying the founders were Russian, and like the key core group was Russian. Wow. And uh, some of the, like genius level intellect, like superior, even beyond me at that point, right? Because they were a bit older. Yeah. And um, more experience. So you you think you were probably the youngest member within that group? Obviously, you don't know them. You oh, don't know oh, them. Yeah? You don't know for sure because like nobody like tells you their age. Absolutely, but you can tell from mannerisms. Like looking back and thinking through my head and seeing some of the logs and the chats dynamics. Like I said, I was older myself. I never told anybody my age, but I can see like how my text would come across as immature and like younger they because I was, it. I was super well, young. You, you were, you were 14, 15 years old at this time. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I'm looking back and thinking about the way they were writing stuff and it was more structured and more mature. So I, I'm under the assumption that they were older and I was the youngest. So there comes a time where you're a genius now, you're like a young, a young stallion in the wild and you're running and no one could catch you or touch you. That's in your mind, you're going, you're going. And then you hit a company called Dell. 
What happened with Dell? Who's, what's that company, Dell? Dell is one of the biggest manufacturers in the world for computer components. Um, for pieces, you mean? Like for, for Yeah, they build PCs, they build laptops, things of that nature, so, other components, peripherals. So you managed to close them down? I did. I, uh, <laughs> so so let's, just, let's just put ourselves in, in context here. So from, you, from your joining of the group TNT, after this, you, you came in contact with other hackers who had abilities, other mm -hmm. programmers who, who were able to complete your skill set if you wanted to do a, a massive attack like this. Yeah. Um, once, once you guys, once you met these, these people, you, you branched out of TNT to do your attacks or you did them as a part of TNT? Good question. Um, so I, I ended up teaming up with a guy named Sinkhole, who was another hacker. He was not a part of TNT. But he was literally the best programmer in the in, and had the best skill set to augment mine in terms of what I ended up launching, which is a denial of service attack. So I worked with him very closely. He would code something, I would get it back, I would do my end of the coding, give it back, like back and forth. We would even um, go into the same box so we can see each other, like what we're what we're writing, and we could code simultaneously. So I had developed a, the tool with him, and TNT. Like when you join a group of this stature, you're a target. Okay, all the, target? all the other hackers want to take you out to say that we took out the best. Okay. Yeah. okay. Right? It's okay. like a, it's a never ending battle of who's number one. And so to your point is that I really wanted to create something to kind of, because hacking at this point, if you look at it from a war perspective, because there was a war internally between hackers. And it was like an arms race. Who can make the best tool that will take over this channel, hack this hacker, or shut them down? And that's where I said, you know what? Like, let's, let's expand on this concept and make something called a mass distributed denial of service attack, which is hacking 50,000 plus boxes or computers out there and networks and combining them all into one. To shoot them at the same place so they could bust the... the, the right. The, that's how it works. Like you put everybody and you send them in the same place. You direct them with one click of the thing so it overloads the, the system. And then what happens? It just Is that how you fall? Is that how it breaks? Or? Yeah, in theory, that's right. Like The best way to explain it is just imagine Domino's. Like you call Domino's pizza. Yeah. If there's too many calls going on at once, it's busy. You can't get through to Domino's. So I'm overloading them with requests and then the site obviously can't deal with the load that I'm sending them. So it shuts down or it gets lagged. It, it depends on the size of the attack. But to your original point, I wanted to do this as a demonstration to other hackers to show them the amount of power that a member in TNT has so that if you come after us, this is what the recourse is yeah, going to yeah. be. And CNN was actually, uh, you know... A, a, a site that I took down, Amazon? Yahoo, eBay. <gasps> But your oh, first one was man. Yahoo, right? Yeah. So I picked Yahoo because at this time, Yahoo was the world's biggest search engine. Kind of like the Google of today. Correct. And they dealt with the most amounts of bandwidth. So if you could shut them down, you could pretty much shut down anyone. Yeah, because so they made a statement. But by doing that, by doing that, if I understand correctly, you're... Um, You're keeping the business from doing business because you shut them down. So there's, you're talking about a, a lot of money. It's costing a lot of money to those companies, right? Yeah, there is financial loss, um, especially like people don't realize too. A lot of these companies have like web farms. Like when I shut down CNN, for instance, 1,200 other sites went down with CNN. Oh, okay. So a lot of them are linked. They're all on the same server and, and stuff of that nature. But how long did they shut down? How long were they uh, like overloaded or each each uh, an hour each attack was or? different. Uh, I, I pick and choose. I can keep the attack going continuously for days, weeks. It's up to me. Holy I obviously was only running tests, so I did it for like an hour here, two hours there, three hours there. And sometimes there was so much data that even when I let go of the attack, It would take a while. For It'll it take to a while up. to recuperate. Okay, I got to ask you this question. You're sitting there. You're king of the hill now. When was the first time you got scared? So <laughs> I was at my best friend's house. I remember this like it was yesterday. I was at my best friend's house and we were sitting in his basement. We were watching TV. I was uh, drinking Sunny Delight and... Uh, <laughs> The news, like we were watching a show and then like there was a news flash that came on 
And uh, it was the president of the United States making a comment about the attack that I launched. What? Yeah. President who who was Clinton? president at the time? Was it Car uh, President Bill Clinton? I can't believe that. Yeah, pretty wild. <laughs> That's crazy. And you're 15 years old and you're in your friend's basement and you see what you did on... So uh, what's your reaction when you see that? So I mean... Obviously, there's some concern, like, there's a sense of, like, accomplishment, but that quickly got drowned by, like, holy shit, the President of the United States is talking about me, and then, <laughs> and, and, and it, you think it can't get any worse than that, but then after his conference, it was the Attorney General of the United States, Janet Reno, coming on and saying, we're going to get whoever's responsible for this, we're going to... We will put any amount of resources to figure it out. Did you at that point, when you saw that happen, when you did you run home? I would have done it. Did you run home and tell dad? Like, hey, I'm in some shit here, I think. No, I, you know? I, I was I was very level headed. I think I was more mature than my age dictated. And I guess maybe from the divorce or something, like I was just kind of desensitized a little bit to like big things happening. Obviously, I was still affected, right? Like you see yeah. the president talking about you. It's pretty crazy, but I was controlled and yeah, I had to pick a time to eventually tell my father about it because I figured, you know, maybe I need to get prepared in some way. He's older, he's an adult. Maybe he knows what, what procedure can be done, what we could do about it. So that's where you introduced to Yan. Yes. You met yeah. Jan uh, Romanowski? Romanowski, yeah. Romanowski. I couldn't say his name, so I say Jan. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but uh, I talked to him for two hours <laughs> yesterday. Two hours. He loves you. You're brilliant. He, he told me the whole story, and he told me how brilliant you are. I was impressed because everybody we talked, it's, it's how brilliant you are. You, you obviously are brilliant since you're here today. But I mean, no, I'm kidding. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but long story short is when your dad sat down with you and the lawyer. Take it from there. So I'll just give you a little bit of context. Before that happened, I had to find the right moment to tell my dad when, you know, like I'm responsible for what you're seeing in the news. And the president talking about it was just the first thing, right? There was a huge cascade. CNN wouldn't stop talking about it. Everybody was talking about it. So I decided, you know, when is the best moment to tell my dad that I'm responsible for this. Because they, all those P Americans, they don't know you're just having fun for an hour and doing this for fun. They think maybe you're a cyber attack or something like that. Could be like a criminal, that. could be a nation state attack from, you know, from another foreign government. They Did had you, no were idea. Were you aware of that, that you were causing that, maybe that problem to them or it was just like nonchalant, like, oh. Uh, At that time, no, I wasn't really that aware. I didn't think that far ahead in the, in the sense that like, in terms of repercussion or, you know, maybe they think it's a foreign government. Like, I didn't really get to... I was more concerned about what I'm going to do at this point. So oh. I had to find a, a moment to tell my dad. And um, I saw him. It was it was a Sunday. It was He was eating a panini. And I told myself in my mind, like, this is the, the best opportunity I'm ever going to get. <laughs> He's enjoying his Italian food. Exactly. <laughs> let's, let's give him the shit now. You got to give an Italian bad news. <laughs> You do it while he's eating. <laughs> That's funny stuff. Yeah, it's okay, the truth. So what happened to his face when you told him? He was taken back a bit. It took another bite of the panini, digested it a little bit, and he was like, all right, here's what we need to do. And I, he was like, I was blown away. He was, my dad is like a, a rock. Nothing phases this guy. And I was so thankful if he was that way because I feel like if he overreacted and got you know, anxious and nervous, like I, it would have translated to me, yeah. right? So he said, we need to go see a lawyer. That's the first thing we're doing. And that's where Jan Romanowski comes into the picture. So when you heard, your, when you heard the broadcast on, uh, on television, did, yeah. they, did they know your identity yet or not? No, no idea. So My they, age, nothing, location, zero. They, they just, didn't know your alias or anything? Not at that point. Okay. They started digging, and then eventually they they found my nickname, and then it's Mafia in the, Boy. Yeah, so that's where Mafia Boy came, actually. Right. Who who gave? Did, did someone give you that name? Yeah. The hackers, or you gave yourself that name? So my original nickname, which not too many people know this, but my original nickname was Archangel. That was my hacker name, and then. One day, my brother Lorenzo used my computer because I showed him how to download MP3s. Remember, like the music files. Yep, yeah, yeah. 
So I showed him how to do that and he went on IRC and he went to the channel where I showed him where you download the MP3s and I told him, make sure you change your name when you do it. Like, don't go under Archangel, you know? So he logged on and his name was Mafia Boy. <laughs> okay. And then when I logged back in and he forgot to change his name. You liked it. I liked it. I thought it was more aggressive and sinister, whereas like Archangel, like Angel, like yeah, it's too... Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Nice guy. Yeah. Too soft. Yeah, and yeah. like Mafia Boy was like, you know. And how did he, did you ask him if you could take the name? Or no, I just took it. Yeah, just took <laughs> it. You're, like, you're a taker. Yeah, you got to take what you want That's in life. It. That's but how you get it, it. Is it fair to say that your brother was a good influence for you? Or was he at least uh, an inspiration for you when you were young? Your older brother? Absolutely. He was my older brother. I idolized him. He was always yeah. good at everything. Sports meeting people, girls, whatever it was, he was just good at it, yeah, so. Yeah. Amazing, I mean, I was in that position with my brother Raymond. My brother Raymond was five years older than me, and uh, like, so when I was young, growing up, 13, 14, you know, it was like, oh my God, you know, I signed with the girlfriends, his boat. And exactly. <laughs> I was going like, hey, I want to be like that. <laughs> like the car you just drove in with. Oh. Anyway, long story <laughs> short is, uh, I want to know now, you meet your lawyer, you meet with your dad. Now, you had a plan. You had a you had a plan with your lawyer, the, a, a, and to uh, and your lawyer actually gave you a plan, and he said if ever something happens, if ever you approach, yeah. So the interesting thing was is that we didn't know at this point if they were ever going to find me. Oh, we no? didn't we didn't know at this point, okay, right? Because we don't know the information on their side. Do they know my real name? Do they know so where I live? So you thought at that point you may get away with it. We may get away with it. This was just as a precaution, and in case they do come, at least we have, you know, a procedure set in place. And he advised us, um, when you get a, if they come and you get arrested, you make sure you don't say anything to anyone. And all you do is have someone call me, and it doesn't matter what time, I will be there. Yeah. And he delivered on his word, let me tell you. And because. You know, and you know what he told me about you? What? He said, I don't want to go too fast there, I'm excited. But when you were given the words, the only words you were allowed to say is, I'd like to talk to my lawyer. And that was the only words. And he told me through thick and thin, I don't want to get there yet. But you were there and you were, you were like your dad, a rock. Yeah. You never flinched. You never. Zero. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he, he had good words to you about your character. and, and uh, That's nice of him. I mean, he's accurate in what he's saying. I honestly wasn't phased. I wasn't, uh, you know, I, and, and they tried. They attempted, you know, because they came in the night. They came at a month and a half later, I think. Eh? A month and a half later, after your uh, first uh, meeting with your, weren't you at a Saint About Hubert's the, restaurant with your dad when you yes. saw it on the news? Yeah, it popped on TV, and you went like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, <laughs> but it was about a month and a half, two months after that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they ended up uh, initiating the raid at uh, 3 a.m., which you were not there. I wasn't at home. You were at your friend's house down the block. I was at my friend's watching Goodfellas. <laughs> <laughs> True story. You can't make this really? up. Really? You look like your dad when you say that. That's awesome. Yeah. You got your dad's eyes. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm watching Goodfellas. You know, <laughs> that's us. Awesome. You know this guy here, GF. You know he doesn't talk a lot, but he has so many questions he'd like to ask you because he, <laughs> I think he hacked. He, he tell him, GF. He seems computer think? savvy. I can get that. That's my spider sense. No, but I think right? he went against you. I think he went against you at one time. Oh, maybe. No. Okay. What happened, GF? Well, well TM TMT. Yes, we. Uh, always war and stuff like that but in my young time I was a hacker too and I learned computer that way awesome so did we ever butt heads is that what's going on <laughs> well maybe I don't know <laughs> <laughs> hey if you do don't use my internet okay please don't you mess with my internet please <laughs> no problem <laughs> thank you thank you so much do it on his uh, yeah 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 Jean-Francois Yel you know you go there it's, it's a lot of stuff a lot of room that, that was in the kid's time uh, when I was a kid uh, I was starting using uh, free BSD yeah it's uh, 10 years old and I was hanging around on the MERC we had Warriors group. Uh, I was, I was. Uh, Were you on EFnet or? No, uh, Undernet. Undernet, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, with uh, Empire Z and um, many uh, little hackers. We we do not go much in the Hefnet. I, I I had I went on Undernet too. I went on Dalnet, yeah. but EFnet was like the main core of like the major hacker groups, and yeah. uh, I was with RNS, the MP3 group. Also, I was with Razor. Michael. I gotta ask you. Yeah. 
They're coming to knock at your door to come and get you. You're not there. You're at the neighbor's house, four or five houses down? or No, it was a couple. It was about five, ten minutes away. So they arrested your dad and they arrested you. But what I want to know is why did they separate you? Like you went with the FBI and you also went with the GRC. You went with both, and they, I heard through the, your lawyer that they, they really tried, like in the movies, to play good cop and bad cop. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, so after they arrested me, they brought me to my house because I guess by juvenile law, they have to read me my rights in front of a guardian or oh, something. That's right, you're not 18 years old. No, I was 15. So they brought me to my house, and immediately I was like, you know, where's my dad? My dad wasn't even there. He was arrested and taken away. Oh, my God. So when you went back to the home, they already arrested your dad. Yeah. So luckily, my brother showed up shortly after. He was out clubbing, and he got home at 3.30 in the morning because it was a Friday night that they came. And he came, and he, you know, my brother's very protective, very aggressive. Like, I'm complete opposite. I'm super cool, calm, chill. But my brother is always the protector of the family, and he started, like, he almost got arrested himself. Because he started getting in the in the GRC's face and the FBI and saying, what are you doing? Where's my dad? What are you doing with my brother? You're not taking him anywhere. And then um, they got really upset because he said in Italian, no dice niente, which means don't say anything. I say that again? No dice niente. No dice, no dice niente. Perfect. You're an Italian. <laughs> I got a little bit of Italian. She's sitting on the dance floor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but you're not allowed to talk in foreign languages in front of them because they don't understand what you're saying. So they said, if you say one more word in a language we don't understand, no you're going to be detained. Mm. They were intimidating you, actually. They were trying to intimidate. But this is where I guess my cool calmness comes into effect, and I'm not phased by these things. Uh, they tried so many tactics, and then when I'm in the car and they're... I'm with the FBI and the RCMP, and they're taking me to the RCMP headquarters uh, in downtown in Westmount. And they're like, you know, we have your dad arrested. You either got to tell us what, what's going on or we're not going to release your dad. And they were trying these type of Did underhanded tactics. Did they say tactics. any things like, uh, like uh, your dad already confirmed this? You know, since they had you in two places different, you know, like tried to make you talk. They didn't, uh, they didn't try that. I think they would know that. It's complete bullshit because I know my dad. And secondly, my dad didn't really know much about what I did. Yeah. He just know that I'm the one responsible, but he didn't know how or yeah. why and this. And he that. couldn't like, explain anything. He to couldn't him. explain anything. My dad barely knew how to use a fax machine. And when they when they arrested your dad, obviously they dropped all their charges because they had nothing on him later. Yeah. But um, they... Well, that's kind of weird too, eh? That they that they did that. They kind of like tried to strong arm you maybe by uh, by uh, making you scared for your dad or. I think honestly, I I respect the GRC. I understand like law enforcement is a tough industry. Hey, you better because I am the Mountie. <laughs> so there you go. Hey, you better. <laughs> but in reality, like when you're dealing with underage kids, like I don't think that that's the route and tactic that you should be nah. using. Like. Taking away a parent and saying, uh, you know, well, we, we have them in. Hey, they in the had lockup. nothing on your dad because they let him go and they dropped all their charges anyway. Exactly. But they're trying to use it as leverage yeah. against a 15 year old. Like it's very weird. I, I don't think that's, you know, proper etiquette and that's the way it should be done. I mean, maybe if they had an entirely different approach and said, listen, Michael, we, we you, you know, what you did was wrong and we want to help you and kind of, you know, put you on the right path. I would have been more receptive to that than you're arrested, we'll arrest your brother, your dad's in yeah. jail. Uh, There's a saying, and, and, and now there's something I went really far to get for you. There's something dans le, dans le monde juridique uh, that they say. In the legal world. In the legal world, they say there was a big judge at the Supreme Court that said, hey, when you, sent, when you have a kid that's underage, you try to give him tools to help him in life. You exactly. don't. You don't try to, to to crucify him because he's not a man yet. Correct. And I honestly, you know, this is later on, but I genuinely felt bad about what I did, and I made it my life's mission on my own to to help and raise awareness around this topic. I work with some of the biggest companies in the world, educating them on today's threats. But maybe if they took that approach, I would have got there sooner than later. And we could have come to an agreement in terms and stuff like that. Not to say that I would work with them, but 
I think there's a way of doing things in life. That's not the way I would have gone about it. I understand it's a difficult business. It was also one of the, the first of this kind of attack. No, so they needed no. to make an example out of yeah. it. But there's a yeah. way of doing stuff For in sure. life. I got to ask you, you sure had a way of doing something. I, I got this story. You got to tell me if it's true. You're sitting at the St. Hubert the restaurant. Now you see the news. So now you're saying, hey, you got to go home. And when you go to go home, there's full of big, huge antennas in front of your house. And like it's it's packed of media down the street. So you didn't want to get out to go in. You don't want to be bothered. So supposedly you found a little road to get into the back so place. So <laughs> we lived on a golf course okay. and, and we were, you know, literally backed onto a golf course. And I was dropped off from an at another section of the golf course and took an underneath tunnel. That's what I heard. You went like in a went movie, you went in a tunnel yeah. and everything and you yeah. live in your room. Absolutely. Uh, awesome. There was, there was 20, 30 media vans with all their antennas <laughs> lifted. Oh, yeah. They're ringing the doorbell. Uh, they're asking constantly to speak to me. And you know, I wasn't having it and I just didn't want to say anything. So luckily I lived on a golf course. Now there comes a time You, you, I think you did six months juvenile uh, detention. Like it's not even a detention. You could go home, I think, and it was like it wasn't too bad, right? The six well, I did more than that. I you mean, do? okay, Maybe. my my full sentence that was given was eight months in a group home facility, but I was under different parameters than the other kids that were in the group home. Like my door was locked and stuff like that. But I had been in juvenile for a few months already. Okay. Um, and bonne conduite, <laughs> like you probably. Uh, so, so you went to uh, juvenile in Northview, and uh, then you went to Odyssey, right? Right. Can you kind of explain the difference between the two dynamics of these two places where kids can end up? I mean, so Northview is an actual juvenile prison. Yeah, that's yeah. the difference. It was much more dangerous quote i don't know how to like really describe it but it was much more criminal and sinister yeah. so you didn't feel necessarily like you were getting better there but more learning different new ways of you want to know the truth i'll yeah. be dead honest with you i knew everybody inside what do you mean i knew all the inmates uh, uh, because i was a bad kid or? i was part of the bad news crew and okay. i i knew all my friends were you know a lot of my friends were doing bad stuff because yeah. when in school I was a pretty bad kid because the problem was is that I was so far advanced and wasting your time there wasting my time I was the kid throwing erasers at the the dart at the board and telling the teacher f you and it was just I wasn't learning anything I knew what they were teaching and I knew what they were going to teach you me in gonna, four years you weren't going to use it in life like one same thing for me in wrestling Right. I was there. I, well, I wanted to become a wrestler. I didn't want to know about math, uh, science, and this and all that. So, 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 so I understand exactly where you're going. So you feel like you're there for nothing in school. That's. I wasn't learning, and I'm a person of that needs information, new information. So I just ended up skipping school, and then I became friends with you know the bad kids who are skipping as well. That's oh, why yeah. I knew I knew most of them when I was inside. Wow. And so what was the difference between Northview and uh, when you were in the, the group home? At, so at the city? group home was more, it was for for like battered children, actually. It was, you start there or do you finish there? I, I finished there. Okay. My I started in Northview that, because they wanted to intimidate me. They put me in like yeah, a real yeah. juvenile. But the judge, when I got my sentence, it was interesting what he said. He said, I'm giving you eight months in a group home facility because... You're a smart kid, and I don't want you to mix with more hardened criminals and kind of set you down the, the wrong path and learn, like, their tricks of the trade. That was good. Yeah, so that's kind of what I was wondering. For you, do you think it was at, to your advantage to go to a place like Odyssey to, for, to help you bounce back in the right direction? Yeah, I think it was an advantage. Cause so for kids, it's better to go to a place like this than to go to a place like Northview. 100%. The so you had decided, you had decided be, when that happened to... to, to, to Say so you were guilty. I pleaded guilty to all the accusations. Over 54 accusations, I pleaded guilty. Because I, I genuinely started to feel bad about what I did. And I was getting older and more mature very quickly. Like uh, when you have an event like this in your life, you're forced to grow up instantly. You feel the judge and them saw that, that you were honest about feeling bad about yourself? Or did you want to, did that change anything? I think they were still a bit harsh because... Here, I had no criminal record, no history, 
And here in, in Quebec, the maximum sentence for a murderer is three years. What do you mean? When you're a juvenile. When you're a juvenile, okay. if you kill someone, okay. the maximum you can get is two years plus an extension. I think there's two years plus an extended one year. And you weren't hitting people. You were hitting machines. I did no physical damage to anyone, exactly. no bottling harm. Exactly. And I still got, let's just say, a third of the sentence of a, uh, of a murderer, which is... Still pretty harsh. It's pretty harsh. And at least, at the very least, he let me serve it in a group home where it was a different environment. So I'm thankful for that. You could go to school also, I heard. Can you go do your classes? Yeah, I, I was able to go to school. And I was able to work. I worked at Le Biftec so during was, this time. So that was good for you then. It wasn't like you were in jail all day long there. No, but when I got back there, I had certain like free time. And then I had to go to my room and the door was locked. And the other kids weren't like that. Okay. They were allowed to, to, to do what they want. It was more of like a, they were, you know, had trouble at home. And like their parents were abusive and stuff. And they went to this group home as like a, a, a shelter, if you will. That's great. Hey, um, we got um, I, I've got, I've got. We were speaking Italian a little bit earlier. Yeah. And I have another Italian word for you. It's a uh, rivolta, which means rebellion in Italian. And this word is a, It's a special word for you. Yeah. Is that arriba? No, arriba. No. Rivolta. No. Rivolta. Uh, it means <clears throat> uprising, things of that nature. What do you mean by so? Uprising? Explain, explain this word in in your context, in your life. So it has substantial meaning for me because the project. Um, that of the attack that I launched, I dubbed the project Revolta. And that to me was a, a key component because, you know, hackers like to name their projects and what they're working oh, yeah. on and, okay. and give something uh, sort of a nickname. And I thought, you know, it is a representation of who I am and what I'm doing at this current moment. Well, you were 15 years old. You might have been going through some sort of rebellion as a teenager at the same time, maybe. There is a correlation there. Okay. Uh, there's definitely a correlation. I think for me at that moment, I was coming out of my shell and I was, you know, rising to the top. I was with the best hacker group. And uh, to me, it, it just symbolized what I, at the point of time I was in my life. Michael, I got to take you back at one spot. Yeah. Uh, there was, there's an, a month and a half there. If I'm trying to remember how your lawyer explained it to me. But when they arrested you on the Friday night, and it was a Friday night that they arrested you, and, 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 and the RCMP, for a reason unknown, and your lawyer didn't want to speak about, which is fine with me, I respect the disc discretion, the RCMP arrested you on that Friday night, but they didn't want to arrest you then. They wanted to wait longer so they could find out what you were doing because they knew it was you, but they didn't know what you and how you were doing it, right? Yeah, I mean... So everything has a strategy involved. They wanted to wait, but uh, they ended up uh, going in and they, they, they chose a Friday specifically because I would go to prison uh, for the weekend. Oh, yeah, okay. You understand the strategy okay, so that's there? that's why it was. Yeah, so It's like, to make you wait longer in prison. Because you can't see a judge on a Saturday and a Sunday. Yeah. If they came on a Monday, I would see the judge Tuesday morning. So it was literally a tactic to it was hey, a pressure, a pressure get a, tactic. Yeah, get a taste of what's to come and pressure tactic. So you finish finish your eight months. It was eight months finally that you did that you say your whole time. Like yeah. Eight months. Then when you walk out of there, what's in your mind? I want to see my friends. I want to. I wasn't even thinking about a computer at that point. Oh no. For the first time in my life, being completely obsessed, the thing I missed the most was my friends and Family. just being free and going out and. I got to tell you, in life, uh, being detained is probably the one of the worst feelings you could ever experience. Being held against your free will and not being able to do what your mind wants to do is it's pretty tough. So, for how long you had that attitude? Like, like you didn't you didn't have a passion anymore? For okay, it was like a few months, uh, <laughs> a month or two, where I wanted to see everyone and hang out and go out with them and and then go party I, a bit. I want to hear what your brain said to you. Well, my brain said you got to get back in computers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so but not hacking, hacking or, or or not hacking. Well, not hacking, but but using my knowledge for good and kind of making my something out of myself. And how can I utilize my talents to in help people? Yeah. So you could still be a hacker, but you didn't have to use your your strength for an evil cause. You could do you could use your strength like a white to hacker. prevent or prevention. There's maybe. there's three colors 
uh, that dictate what type of hacker you are. And it's called a white hat, a gray hat, and a black hat. And a black hat is someone, obviously, as you would imagine, someone who does malicious things. A gray hat is someone who kind of dabbles in both. And then a white hat is a security professional who uses hacking. For pre you could prevent for companies. Yeah, it's all preventative. So would you describe yourself as a white hat today? 100%. Great. Yeah. No regrets? None. No regrets of everything? I think everything back? happened for a reason the exact way that it should have. And I guess the one slight regret is the way I went around launching the attack and kind of how I could have explore, explored and experimented that in a in a closed environment versus a massive public company. That's the one. But you wouldn't have been who you are today. I think I still would have been who I am today. I just wouldn't have had the notoriety behind it. But I'm a man in, who puts his mind to something and knows how to get to that point. You no definitely what would have still had the skills. For sure. The skills wouldn't have went away. Go oh, GF. Uh, I have a question. Uh, did you not been restrained of computer using until 18? I was restrained for a period of time. Um, so I wasn't allowed in a library, part of my conditions. I wasn't allowed in a computer store. I wasn't allowed a specific phone. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I was, after, and I wasn't allowed a computer. Time, after you did your time, you it were It persisted for a little bit. Um, you were in probation for a year after you came out, right? Yeah, exactly. So was it the, during this year that you weren't allowed to touch computers? Right. And, and even, even the second that they arrest me, I had bail conditions, and then I had probation after the bail conditions. Okay, yeah. But I was still reading about technology and investing my time in computers because there was programming languages and there's a lot of books you can read. Did you reach the top of the top when you did what you did or after that? Now you're in the, let's say we go back then when you did your time and everything and you're on probation. Is there a place you could have went higher in computers? Like, you know, like, uh, or uh, did you reach the top? I think I was pretty much at the top of, of what I wanted to, to, to succeed at. So no, I, I set out my goal and I accomplished that. The, um, the, um, news banner for, for you guys, for hackers back in the day, wasn't like CNN or Le Journal de Montréal or anything like that. It was force.net. Right. Yeah. So to, to you definitely to, read my book. I so, think. Yeah, I did. It was <laughs> great, <laughs> you read the whole excellent book. book. Oh my God. I was in, oh man, I was in that thing the whole time for real. It I was appreciate very, that. Very good book. But um, what, what uh, he was saying is um, if you made it all the way to the top. So by looking on force.net, you would kind of know who uh, was, you know, headlining, right, in the, in the media Correct. for that group. Yeah, so it was kind of like a, a news site that revolved around EFNet and IRC and all the hacker communities and what they were doing and who was launching the highest tier, highest level attacks. Like you wouldn't make it on force.net unless... Unless you were really the... Yeah, so, and I, I was on there all the time for taking over certain channels. I hacked IRC networks and gave myself operator status, like crazy stuff, crazy, wow. crazy stuff. Wow. The, um, the, the thrill that you got, like coming from the, uh, the addiction to the, the computer or today to phones, we see kids a lot with the, yeah. the addiction to technology. Um, can you, can you put that in, in, in context for us? Is it how, how, um, intensive an addiction is it? For, for people that are in that situation? See, I think it's extremely unhealthy today. You see, at least my obsession, I was exploring and learning. Now we have kids who are just going on social media and literally floating through people's posts that are, you're not really educating yourself. I was using technology as a tool to enhance my mind. Yeah. Now you look at the obsession <laughs> and the obsession revolves around social media, Instagram, Snapchat. and Yeah, it's all about me. Correct. And, and then you're also setting standards that are almost unobtainable, especially like imagine you're a girl in today's world and you're seeing these insane models uh, on Instagram. Yeah. You know, how do you compare yourself to that? And that's the problem. These kids are constantly comparing themselves to that something that's unrealistic. You know what I mean? Like love yourself and love the way you are. But it's kind of hard to do that in today's world when everything is flashed in front of your face. So what's what's your recommendation? What's what's um, well? I have a two-year-old, so I've already thought about this. <laughs> what, what's a kind of time frame? No what's computers. a kind of schedule? A healthy schedule for for a kid uh, with the technology. What kind of time it, it, limits it, could we talk about? 
I don't like want to set certain rules and guidelines. To me, it comes down to more what are you doing with the technology. Okay, yeah. If you want to scroll through Instagram all day, then forget it. I'm not even giving you a smartphone. So, so how can a how can a a 60 year old understand what a what a younger person who understands the technology is doing? Is there tools that uh, parents can use to understand better what their kids are doing online? Yeah, there's network monitoring tools that you can set up. There's parental controls you could set up. Uh, there, there, there is answers to this question and giving parents some of the control. It's just crazy to think that the world we live in now, like, like I was punished. It's go to your room, stay there. Now you can't even punish a kid like that because they have all the tools and the gadgets. It's like now we turn off the Wi-Fi. That that's punishment. Now, now. you punish him <laughs> by saying you go play baseball outside. That's it. It's like <laughs> go outside, let's get the sun, like. <laughs> Hey, Michael, after all this ordeal, there's a movie that, that, that was proposed to you. Yeah. And, uh, but you weren't totally in agreement with that movie. Uh, tell, tell me about that movie. They, they, they had a, a, a nice budget for, you, for, for the whole thing to happen, but there was something against your priorities that kept you from making that movie. Am I right or am I lost? Or? I can't really discuss too, too much about okay. it because okay. a lot of it is protected okay. uh, NDAs okay. and okay. stuff like that, okay. but I, this is my life. This isn't just a movie and I don't care about the outcome. Like I care. I, this book, I wrote it. The co-writer helped structure and and you know make it make more nice professional. Whatnot, exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that this rather than like him meet me and put like a recorder and like just talk and then he writes the book. No, I wrote that book. Okay, I typed it out and it's coming directly from my thoughts. That's why when I, I even I read the book, I read myself. You know, wow. going back to when I would what I when I was doing what I was doing. With a movie, you know, and I get it. They want to dramatize a little bit. They exactly. want to add some flair or whatever. But there still needs to be a key direction. And that's exactly. my identity. And then when I feel like that's lost, then I don't care about any amount of money. Because it doesn't matter. When you're dead, all that matters is what people thought of you. Exactly. You can, can't take your... Uh, and I had heard through the grapevine that... Uh, and that's why they were very impressed. Your lawyer and your father and everybody around you that you were wise enough because you were in a time in your life where money could have come in handy. Sure. But because of your priorities and the way you were brought up and the way you are, you refuse to go on the uh, dramas that are not there and this and that. And, and, and you skip the time for making a lot of money for your, for your good sense. Your, your, uh, I won't compromise I my morals and what I stand for for any amount of good, money. Good for you, man. Uh, uh, that's the most I could have definitely used the money at that yeah, time. Yeah, the biggest yeah. compliment that I had from the, your pairs and people around i'm going to read a part in this book that i really like go ahead if you don't mind absolutely to jacques thanks for taking the time to show up at my book launch all the best <laughs> michael <laughs> kelsey <laughs> i was there michael you remember i went to see you for your it launch? was an honor to have you and a privilege and i'm uh i'm i'm extremely grateful that you took the time well, your father gave me $200, okay, you know, well, I, I, I had to go, you know. The truth, the truth always comes out, I guess. will come out. <laughs> he told me, yeah, Jacques uh, coming, don't worry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a chat with my dad after. Yeah, that. yeah, that's good. Hey, listen, I got, the, I, I, I got another question for you. Um, very imp Oh, yeah. My, it's my girlfriend. She said, you got to ask him, have you ever been, have you ever been victim Cyber, what cyber, uh, cyber intimidation? Cyber bullying? Cyber bullying yeah. on internet. There's a lot, eh? Yeah, there's tons. Because we talk about intimidation on this show all the time, but we Dude, thought that my, for you it would, be, it would be better to, that we could talk about cyber intimidation with you. You probably know all about that. Yeah, it's a big problem today. It's led to, unfortunately, many suicides. Uh, are we? Are we? Yeah. It's, uh, people are mean. Huh? People are mean on Facebook. The problem is, is that technology has amplified it so that if you do something and, and it's now all on a public forum, right? Whereas, let's say you were you were embarrassed at a school, your parents could change your school, and it's like a fresh start. Yeah. You know, unless obviously there's some type of connection and someone knows someone from that school and they get the story. Which it was much more difficult. Whereas today, 
It's completely known. You do something at school, you'll hear about it on the bus, you'll hear about it at home when you go on your computer at night, it follows you everywhere now. And everyone knows. And everyone knows. And then, you know, that's why you have certain people who are shamed and, and bullied and, you know, it's just never ending. And the, But they can't stop that bullying on the internet? Or? It, it's, the problem is, is that technology is enabling people. We as humans need to be conscious and aware of what we're doing and educate kids at a younger age. You have sex education in school. Why isn't there cyber bullying, cyber, cyber security as an education? We're exposing to kids to all this technology, but they're not properly. No, we yeah. haven't caught up yet. No, and that's that's the problem right now, and there's a big gap. And then you have, you know, kids who, they're 14, 15, they have all this technology, and the guy is asking the girl, you know, send me the nudes and this and that, and before you know it, he posts it publicly, and like that girl's ruined for the rest of her life. <sighs> yeah. This is the type of world we live in today, and once it goes on the internet, it lives there permanently. And you these can't people, take it down. The people, the authors of these crimes are faceless and nameless people. You can't, you, you can't, you can't know determine. who they are. So yeah. they, they feel super powerful because they don't feel like they're going to have to answer for their actions. It's almost better, like, as sad as it is, like, back in the day, like, maybe taking a beating is almost better than yeah, what's going course. on today. You finish the next day and that's it. Yeah, that's it. You take your beating. If anything, you're getting stronger to a certain extent. Um, but by today's standards, it's more of a psychological yeah. component. And that can ruin you for the rest of your life. What would be... Un conseil, uh, in English. Advice. I know what conseil is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A recommendation. A, a, a recommendation for the kids to prevent bullying. I guess there's none. Huh? They're, 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 you, can't, you can't prevent it. Yeah, huh? I think that kids need to talk to their parents about it. A lot of them are ashamed. Like maybe, like let's say, like the scenario we just gave, like maybe the girl wouldn't want to tell her parents what she did, right? It's embarrassing and yeah. now it's exposed. But you have to do that. Because your parents will get involved, they'll get the authorities involved. And kids these days, like, as we said, it's nameless and whatever, but if authorities get involved, they can do IP tracing and find out who the culprit is if you go that route. Yeah. Unless but the, the thing kid is, is smart. Calling, calling someone a, a nasty name isn't a crime necessarily. So there's no reason for the police to get involved. Well, it depends where you live. Uh, yeah, but if you say something like example, I say, uh, oh, my neighbor, you know, the fat girl that's there and there. For him, it's like just a, a, a word. Yeah. But for her, when she reads it, it it's, destroys It's devastating, it. for sure. It destroys it. There's, there's no like right 100% answer solution to this, but I think talking about it and... and Other kids, if they would come forward and use themselves as an example to give other kids courage to, to talk about it, I think that's the People start. wouldn't feel so alone in that. Yeah, you have yeah. to open the door and know that you're not alone. Is there a... When, when someone like me... <laughs> I, I often do that. Not that bad, but I do it. I speak my mind. I don't think. I don't turn my tongue seven times before writing. Yeah. Is there a delay on Facebook? Like, let's say, or the, if you put something, like, and, 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 and there's someone up there that says, hey, that's not good. We can't, like, you know. No. Everything is posted first, and then, if anything, it gets flagged and reviewed later. Wow. But you can post anything you want. Wow. I'm that's the, that's the That's the power of the internet, good and bad. Uh, in some elements, it could be beneficial, but obviously there's, you know, there's the bad side to everything. So, Hey, Michael, when I, when I think about um, someone, um, someone like um, Akil, one of those hackers, one of those elite hackers you talk about in your, in your, in your book, uh, there's many, you mentioned many hackers, famous hackers from history. And I was wondering, uh, coming from your perspective, which... Which one is the is your favorite or your most interesting? Oh, that's what yeah. It's got to be him. <laughs> Besides, GF. but too bad he was on undernet. <laughs> I, li I like to, to remain as it goes. <laughs> so much more low key, at least. So who who do you think is one that sticks out among among the gang? So the thing is, is that there's different uh, different hackers that excelled at different. Yeah. capacities and different elements their skill set was different so like if we use kevin mitnick who's the most famous hacker in the world as an example he was more of a social engineering component why right? was he the why was he the best hacker in the world i wouldn't say the best but he's the most well known because when he got arrested in the united states and he he got five years in prison and it do? was what did he do Ah, uh, it's too long of a story okay, to well, explain. Did he go into the system? He went into the system. He, he, he hacked something called like SAS and, and broke into uh, the American telephone systems. 
and uh, was able to do some nasty stuff with administrative privileges on the back end of what... Uh, Has there anybody been able to go into the government or, let's say, the defense system? Absolutely. Or, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Even when I was doing my scans, I saw government sites that I could have hacked, but I decided not to. Mm. They're not protected against hackers, uh, the government or the... No. There's always someone smart enough to break in. If a human makes it, a human can break it. Never forget that. That's, That's a hacker's key. mentality right there. 100%. And it's, the, it's 100% fact. But to your point, I would name you a hacker. You never heard of him. He's not known. He's not famous. Um, you you know. don't have to say his name if you don't want to. But why was he your hero, this person in particular? Because the level of understanding, like there's people who understand there's layers in life okay there's surface level and then you go a little deeper 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 this guy understood the absolute base level of technology at its core at its heart and knew how to program around that that element which is it just blew my mind because every time you think you're you're the best or you get good or you're really there's always someone there's always someone that Better. just has unlocked and it has something that you don't comprehend yet and you could learn it and then he goes further down the hole so yeah, it's yeah. he's already further by the time you learned what he knew uh, correct yeah. so there's yeah, a yeah. never end never ending learning in in, in that Th listen there's a we haven't even explored space yet. We haven't even explored 80% of the ocean. We're so, we're, we're infants in terms of the history of human beings. Like we're, this planet has been around for a billion years, uh, if, if more. And we're just, we've been here, what, 5,000 years? The surface. 5,000 years? It's that like, we've been, to, that we've been techno the woken in a technology perspective. We haven't, it's not been very long, maybe not even 5,000 years. But that's what I mean. So like you look at when humans started and then the industrial age and then when like techno the technological age came into play, like we're so new at everything. There's so much to scratch underneath the surface. So in a day, in a, in a day and age like today, we hear of people like... Um, like Edward Snowden, who who just put out a an, another video on uh, the Rogan, and I'm 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 interested to to know your perspective on this man, on Edward Snowden. What what do you think about this guy? You know, I, I you don't know, know him. You know him? Yeah, he's yeah. famous. He's a f he's very well known, and there's like there's like see, so hacking has turned into it has evolved into many things now you have hacktivists you have political hackers people who stand for certain things and want to leak information from the government that they're keeping private you have whistleblowers yeah. he, he would wow. he would be a, considered a whistleblower he's a, he's considered in the whistleblower so category he gives, scoops. He, he gives scoops he gives sensitive information that perhaps shouldn't be made public and you know i have mixed feelings about it because okay. i feel like Everything should be made public and we have a right to know. But then I look at the maturity of society today and I think maybe we're not ready to know everything. Should be restrictions. Like restrictions. you see what's going on. We see COVID. Uh, the second there's something, panic ensues. Go buy all the toilet paper. Like, hey, I'm the first one there. Okay, I was no. the You're part of the problem. Costco, it's yeah. it, baby. <laughs> hey, Costco, I'm problem. I'm, I, I, uh, I had Costco. There's no more toilet paper. <laughs> but this is the problem, is that when we reveal information that could potentially cause panic, it causes panic times 10. So Human maybe nature. some stuff... We're maybe we're just so not mature enough. that guy was a guy like that, the guy you were talking about. Snowden, he yeah, he's still he's still kind of hiding, I guess. Right now, we don't. Well, know he where always he is seeks and asylum and all this shit and and hides and this so and that. So he's been researched now by the police and stuff like that. Is he? Is he, he always or? finds places that will like host him because they won't cooperate with uh, authorities and give him up and stuff like that. Yeah, I got some fans that uh, I asked a few questions, just a couple, if you don't mind. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions like that. There's Martin La Jeunesse uh, who asks you, what are you doing today? What am I doing today? Well, podcasting. this is a long question. <laughs> podcasting, yeah. <laughs> well, right now I'm with you in the middle of I don't know where, but... Uh, <laughs> so I've taken, I've done exactly what I wanted to do and I've taken my knowledge and I've educated some of the biggest companies in the world and individuals and I've started a company called Optimal Secure, which is a pen testing company. So I do ethical hacking, which is hack companies all through an agreement. They're giving me permission and I show them how I got in and what I did and how I did it exactly wow. so they can patch those holes. Wow. 
And um, so my biggest role, which I'm proud as like a Canadian to achieve is I serve as chairman for the security advisory board for HP, which is Hewitt Packard. And uh, it's an incredible role. Like uh, they can choose anyone in the world to have that From position. From a zero to a hero. I mean, for me, that's like literally one of my biggest accomplishments that I could hope for in terms of wow, uh, success in a career. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. It's, an, it's a tremendous role. And I do it for Canada, for Montreal, Quebec. You know, like it's a, it's a tremendous role for uh, a Quebecer to have. And we're happy to have you on our side, buddy. I'm, I'm happy to be here. My son was so <laughs> Born and raised. My son was a, my son's a chicken shit. My son is so funny. Before you got here, you were saying, don't mess with him now. Don't tell him that. They, I was saying, leave me alone. I'm not well, on I internet. Said, do you know what you could do with the internet today? You could literally make someone deceased, turn off all their credit cards, file a death record. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff. It's scary. He's not wrong. So, uh, so, so be I'm careful. Glad, so I'm, I'm disappointed uh, you got paid 200 to show hey, up to yeah, the book, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the book but, launch. But hey, listen. So, hey, I, I have a memory use, like an elephant. You use eh? your brains when I use this here, you know? <laughs> and hey, but then it's okay because he watched The Godfellows, so I better stay calm there. <laughs> the Goodfellows, right? The yeah. Goodfellows. I'm going to stay cool. But anyway, here's another question. Of what about, actually, it's not a question. I tried to make it a question because one of my old wrestlers that used to wrestle with me, yeah, he, said, he told me, he says, do you, he's talking to you. His name is Ate Ahmed. Do you remember going to his company PCM for a conference? Yes. That was, he was there. Absolutely. The yeah. So part of, just to go back to the last question as well, like I, I do a lot of presentations and I do keynotes discussing what I did and the psychology of hackers and how that has evolved and uh, give them education and what the threat landscape looks like and what hackers are doing and how they could protect themselves. And I definitely remember yeah, PCM. He, do you? He was very impressed. Yeah. He was very, very impressed by you. Yeah. I said, well, that's because you don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can tease. He's afraid. He's a chicken chain. He's like, okay. no, no, don't tease him. Don't I'm tease a nice him. guy. I, yeah, know, I, don't get on my dad's side, though. I know your dad. Yeah, yeah, I, I won't. Hey, my dad's <laughs> old now. Don't worry yeah, about yeah. it. Hey, talk <laughs> about your dad. Hey, I want to I wanna show you something. I got something on your dad. You know your heart? Is as big as your dad. Bonsoir, Jacques. Uh, je sais que vous allez rencontrer mon fils. Je voulais juste vous envoyer un message pour lui, de lui donner un remède. Uh, je suis très, très fier de mon fils uh, pour quest ce qu'il a accompli. Il est sur la bonne voie. C'est un méchant bon garçon. Fait que, uh, je veux juste te donner le message que son père est très, très fier de lui. Merci beaucoup. That's sweet of him. Eh? I owe it all to my parents, honestly. They were, it was a good balance. My mom was strict and my dad was more relaxed. And that balance made me who I am today, I think. And, you know, I owe it all to my parents. Uh, I think it definitely made me the person I am today. And, so. and, 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 and now you're a father, you have a two-year-old son, your, your, your life is going, your dream has come true yeah. professionally. And hopefully at home too. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. You like the family, and the, you. Like I love my family. I wouldn't change a thing. And you know, uh, my wife, for instance, will always say it's eleven eleven. Make a wish, and I tell her I don't need to make a wish. I have everything I want. There you go. Amazing. So, Michael, I think I went through my notes. Do you have anything special you'd like to promote, or you'd like to mention to the people, or? I just, you know, I I really like the the cyber bullying component. I think. This is a good uh, platform to raise awareness around it. And I think it's critical because I have a kid, you know, and uh, hopefully more kids and, and they're all going to be exposed to this environment. And it's up to us to raise awareness around the topic and and put a stop to it. So I, I, I thank you for having me here and, uh, and having this discussion. I found it to be uh, very invigorating. Be better than you hope? For. Uh, come on. I had low standards <laughs> and expectations for you. Come on. Hey, listen, that book you have in front of you is in French. So, yeah. But I know you know a few words in French. Absolutely. So listen, I'm going to give you a box of those. And, 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 and my last match, I got to tell you, this is very important to me. Okay. He Now, doesn't Michael, remember very Michael, well, so he, you got to repeat a couple of times. <laughs> Michael, look, I want you to know something. You know, you love your dad. Absolutely. And so do I. Your dad... For many years, he drove a. F he took the bus for free, and he took us all to hockey, the, the vedette there, you know. And mm -hmm. we would go play for the Montreal Journal de Montréal to play hockey. And your father was driving the bus; it was for free, do everything for free. Yeah. And then about two years ago, I had my retirement match, which on that book you'll see in the in the last pages, in the last two three pages, I'm, I'm wrestling with my three sons, like my dad did. I think it's the last. Uh, uh, go further inside the book. Uh, further inside the book, okay. there are two three pages. The last page. 
page where they have pictures. And uh, wow. you'll see my dad. Maybe next picture. No, the one after this that. This one? After that. Even closer in the book. No, closer in the book. Before. Closer inside the book. Next picture. 30 years ago, there you go. 30 years ago, my dad retired with his three sons, me, Raymond, and Armand. 30 years later, me and my three sons, we retired. But why I want to tell you this is because your dad made something possible for me. That was my dream. My dream was to wrestle with my three sons like my dad did when I wrestled with him. And your dad, he gave me a bus, the bus that you see on the cover of the book there. That's yeah. your dad who made that. He printed that for me, and it was going all over the states, upper states, New York, and New York, everywhere, and into Canada, everywhere. And, 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 and for a whole year, he promoted my show for free. He did that for me, your dad. And, you know, since it was my dream, your dad made my dream come true. He helped a lot. So, so I just wanted you to know that. That's I, awesome. I love your dad. I love your dad. But he still gave you two hundred dollars to came to the book launch. Yeah, that was bullshit. That was bullshit. I'm kidding. You're a family friend forever, and uh, you know I, uh, we're we're grateful to have this dynamic, and you know it's been a pleasure and honor knowing you. And I remember seeing you all the time when I was younger and getting exposed to the whole wrestling scene. Oh and yeah, stuff. you followed a little bit of wrestling when you. Yeah, were you know it, it was an interesting dynamic, and uh, I I definitely the Rougeau name. You knew the Rougeau name, of right? course. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. So when you saw the Mountie at your door, you said, "Oh, that's Jacques. <laughs> that's my belt Jacques up there. Sent you here. That's my belt. <laughs> Look yeah. at my belt, my Mountie belt up there. You see it up there on the on the. Oh, was wow. the Intercontinental Champion of wow. the Mountie, the real Mountie, and the Mountie always gets his man. Well, you're a man who knows how to accomplish his goals. <laughs> so I got you. I didn't get you where you thought I would, but I got you in my tiki. Well, you got me here. I got and you and in my tiki. But before you leave, Mike, just just before you leave, yeah, could, could you please just give us a little bit of education on how we should protect ourselves? I I, I read in your book, it's written at one point that we should change our our password to treat it like a toothbrush. We yeah. should we should change it. Every six months, and we shouldn't lend it to anybody. Is there anything else that you can that you can add to us people who don't know what the hell we're doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, the first thing is, and it's very easy. Like I would Google like a firewall, and I would set up. And you have something like Zone Alarm, which is like a free product. It absolutely costs you nothing. What does that do? It just it protects like the incoming and outgoing connections, and unless that the firewall can verify and know who or where it's coming from, it won't. Accept it won't that. allow it. Wow! So it's free for download. That's easiest thing you could do. And it's called firewall. It's called Zone Alarm, zone but alarm. firewall is the actual application as, as, as and, and it's free. Advice. We can get it for free on internet. One hundred percent for free. Wow, that's, that's great. great advice. I think that's the best method, and the second best thing is is being consciously aware of what you're doing because. No matter what type of security you have, the human element always remains persistent and hackers are always looking to hack your mind. Don't ever forget that. That was That's complicated okay. for me. I'll ask my son to explain that later. <laughs> I'll okay. break it down for You'll you. You'll break it down for me later. The best I can. 200 bucks charge him. That's it. it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I see your father's face in your face. I love it. I, I love it. I love we don't it. need a paternity <laughs> test there. Yeah, no, 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 for sure. For sure. He's my Listen, dad. Michael. GF, Jay, thank you so much for thank this you. podcast today. I learned so much today. Although I'm happy to be here, man. Thanks. I, I, you made me happy today. Thank you so much. I'm You're happy great. to be here. Thanks, guys. So like, you know, in French, uh, when the wrestling show would finish every week. Salut la visette? No, oh, say, okay. uh, say, à la semaine prochaine, si <laughs> Dieu le <laughs> veut. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was what we said at the end of every show in wrestling. Okay. But it was French, so, you know, they had jo jo uh, George Cannon in English, you know, and the CFCF 12 there, or they had yeah. uh, George Cannon wrestling the Grand Prix that maybe you watched the English wrestling more the Vachons and the, the Andre the Giant. I watched your uh, your interview with JSP and I thought that was uh, no way. No, I mean I I couldn't make it the whole way because I had a lot going on this week. He's and a great guy, huh? Really awesome, man. I'm I'm the amount of humility this man has. It's is crazy. Incredible. It's incredible. He's my hero. That he, guy. He's like a true icon and can't have any more respect for anyone on the planet. This guy is just incredible, and some of his stories are. Legendary. mind blowing yeah. it's it just is. insane it is and, and same to you because you know to be honest with you I've always had the perspective of your John's son yeah not anymore but I in some way you're actually anymore. kind of similar to GSP because GSP also holds all the tools to harm people but he you decides not to and he uses them for good wow. kind of like what you're great doing example. great example great example man great. And so it, congratulations great. man thanks man and just remember, it's we are in control of our faculties and we decide what we want to do with our intelligence our physical strength, whatever it may be, 
you have to choose the right direction. So no, from now on in my book, you're no more mafia boy. You're angel. Uh, Archangel. Hey, Archangel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you good. very much, Michael. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. One. Thank you. Here we go. Let's go eat. For, for us, it's more and let's hack the planet. <laughs> Chaque année, on met nos raquettes pour sillonner la forêt des montagnes Chic-Choc afin d'entailler chacune de nos 100 000 érables pour en récolter l'eau au printemps. Notre réseau de tubulures transporte des milliers de litres de ce précieux liquide sucré vers la cabane où il sera filtré et traité à l'osmose inversée. L'eau d'érable concentrée soigneusement évaporée pour obtenir cet or blond au goût unique d'une qualité incomparable. Une véritable tradition. Le sirop et les produits d'érable de ma cabane en Gaspésie, c'est bon rare. Vous savez, je suis Québécois, mais j'aime bien les tropiques. C'est pour ça que j'ai acheté mes tickets chez Sol Tropical à saint roch de la chigan Un produit 100% québécois, 20 ans sans perdre sa couleur et une espérance de vie de plus de 50 ans. Vous pouvez faire comme une cuisine extérieure, votre chambre d'invité ou même votre propre podcast. Ici Jacques Rougeau, faites comme moi et amenez le soleil chez vous avec Sol Tropical. La vie est tellement plus belle.